a friendship forged in light, um, which is a bit of science history for you. And she's going to be in conversation with uh, two people who also know a lot about the subject of this book. Um, she's in conversation with Ziva Olbaum and Sabina Kreienbuhl. So thanks so much for being here. And um, we are going to allow you to ask questions at any point during the broadcast. And uh, sorry. So if you are watching on YouTube, you just put a comment in the chat there, and then we will be able to see that over here. And um, if you uh, at any point want to let us know where you're tuning in from, please do so. And we are uh, going to hear a little bit from the book, and then also Liz and Ziva and Sabina will be in conversation as well. So. Thank you so much. I'm gonna drop links in the comments as well. Um, and let us know, yeah, where you're watching from and uh, how, you know, if you have any questions about the book after the fact. And I will be back to help with those questions at the end. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, thank you for supporting an independent bookstore by coming to this event. And take it away, Liz, Ziva, and Sabina. Oh my gosh, I'm laughing so hard. I totally forgot I was going to read from the book. So, but I just opened to page um, 61 and we'll see what, what it says. Um, okay, this is a little passage about Loewy dancing at the 1900 Paris Exposition. It was a really cool scene because she had been um, inspired a lot by the scientist Camille Flammarion and looking through telescopes and looking through microscopes. So I'll just read a paragraph. Uh, Loewy's work with the astronomer Camille Flammarion had inspired her firmament dance. Surrounded by light scattering crystals, Loewy would catch the moon from the sky and bring it to earth, projecting it on her robe. Her last creation, an original mirror dance, split and multiplied her image in a myriad of configurations. The more science-minded in the crowd noticed that her work reflected the modern technology they'd seen in the Palace of Optics, where visitors could peer at the moon through a 200 foot long telescope, dive into the microscopic world of Louis Pasteur and study X-rays, crystallographic polarizations and chemical incandescences. So you can see this book really does uh, combine science and art. Um, the scientist Louis Fuller, or sorry, the inventor dancer Louis Fuller um, became friends with the scientist Marie Curie when she asked her for some radioactive um, radium to light her dance costume. They were friends um, pretty much until um, Loewy's death. And the book is about their friendship, about um, their experiences, their triumphs, their struggles. Um, and I'm so happy to have Ziva and Sabine here with me because they, uh, Ziva and I ran into each other and we'll talk about this, like when I was writing the book and they have been my only really live connection to Loie Fuller, who I've been so excited about. And it was so fun to have someone else to talk to. So um, Ziva, do you wanna tell, like talk about how we met? Sure, sure. Um, when, when I reached out to see if I could find in Edison's papers a mention of Loie Fuller, because we all found wonderful newspaper articles from Lowy's point of view, that Lowy talked about Edison, but did he actually have her name written in his calendar? And unfortunately, uh, he didn't. He didn't. But the archivist said, "Oh, you should really meet this woman. She's doing a book on Lowy Fuller." And so then we communicated. And it was such a great pleasure to do something um, because, you, Liz, you had researched some very specific things. As filmmakers, Sabina and I were sort of focused on, of course, Loewy, but other elements of her life and other and other visual materials. So it was, I just remember you, sending me, like we would send questions back and forth. I mostly remember that I asked you questions <laughs> and you were the one that had the answers, that you had figured out exactly where Lowy's theater was and 
Um, but it was, it was symbiotic, I think. It was symbiotic. Yeah, so. and I forgot to tell you, um, we were talking again about Edison and that it, her visit to Edison was well documented in a newspaper, but also in her journal, she wrote about it. Um, and I wrote it, I write a whole scene around that in the book, their meeting. But I was gonna tell you, I also did find, um, it was cool in Edison's archives, I was able to find a whole list of the hundreds of chemicals that he was studying to look for um, different fluorescent chemicals to use in his x-ray um, oh, machine that he was working on. So that was really cool. That's really fascinating. And he was a very um, sort of a curmudgeon. I mean, he has a reputation as a, not a people person. So it's, it's very interesting to imagine. I like the way you, uh, the way you wrote the scene of the two of them together is really, uh, is really great. Oh, well, thank you. Well, I'm interested to see what, how you talk about him in terms of film because he wanted to film Loie's dances, but she didn't do it, right? Because she didn't think he could adequately represent her dances because they didn't have color film, right? Right. We never came up with an actual primary source which detailed why she wasn't filmed. Do you, did you come across something? It was in uh, some of the biographies I read. So I didn't right. find a, exactly. I didn't see the primary source either, but um, it's, it's interesting that he did film an American actress um, doing that dance and it, didn't it become one of the most popular films, like first films ever, mm -hmm. The Serpentine? Annabelle Whitford Moore was the one. And actually, you know, we've been trying to, I think we're going to have uh, a, uh, a collection of all the Serpentine dancers because we really wanted to make sure that there was not one film of her. So we have about 40 different film, 40 different Serpentine dances from all over. And of course, a lot of them were you know duplicates and every archive has a different one with different color applications and just recently we found these beautiful stills that were of the Annabelle Whitford Moore dance that um that again are part of that dance but it's only individual still so even if you connect them they don't make the whole film but they're so stunning compared to some of the other ones so it's really amazing how people you know th their fantasy world stuck you know blew up as they were you know thinking of this, this dance and the colors that that they might have you know could have possibly seen but obviously it's two-dimensional it will never represent uh, well, it's so cool. I see that that Jody Sperling is on this um, on this chat, and she is the modern Loie Fuller dancer. Who, if you if you look up the the, the French film, is it La La Danseuse? Is that um, you will see her choreography. But and if you look up Loie Fuller, a lot of people think that Jody's dances are Loie Fuller, but they're just stunning. So. In our film, we have actually collaborated with Jody, and she and we have filmed her through her process of creating a performance. Oh, cool! So that it's really very extraordinary. It's extraordinary. She was my other Loie Fuller contact who I had throughout this process. So, how yes. how did you decide to make a documentary about Loie Fuller? I never asked you that. Um, well, I actually came across uh, across a clip of you know one of the serpentine clips with I think it's Bob Walter is the mm -hmm. performer, and um, I was wor I was working on a film I, I edited a film called Picasso and Brock Go to the Movies, and it was all about the 1900 exhibition, and you know there is also and the, the film was um, came together as part of a show at Pace Wildenstein where the curator actually made this, um, um, uh, you know, this figured out and researched the fact that probably Picasso saw Loewy at the, at the 1900 exhibition. Mm -hmm. Again, there is not, a, not one clear indication, but she also looked at his work that came out of it and the, especially the Demoiselle d'Avignon when you look at the sketches and compare them to 
a serpentine dance, there is a lot of similarity. And so that was the premise of the film and the idea that the Cubist had actually been influenced by movies, uh, you know, the early movies. So that's where I saw the first time this clip and I had, you know, after Ziva and I finished um, our previous film Letters from Baghdad, we were looking for another super interesting woman who has been written out of history or, you know, forgotten, let's say, for a mainstream audience. And um, we talked about Chloe Fuller and then we researched more about her and, you know, realized also how contemporary Chloe Fuller is and her, her work. And that sort of became our, you know, our new project. Liz, I'm so curious to know, um, and I don't know if you have an answer for this, but what do you, what surprised you the most about the similarities between Marie Curie and Lowy? And are there any similarities between them? They, I, at first glance, they're, they're polar opposites. Mm -hmm. I mean, Marie is very, serious, very private. Um, she did, she hated publicity. She just wanted to be in her lab doing her work. Loie loved the spotlight, obviously. She loved publicity. Could you imagine how popular she'd be on Instagram today? I mean, she was so good. She was so good at self PR, like Edison too. Um, but I think what they had in common was their curiosity. Mm -hmm. I think that's mm -hmm. probably why they um, became friends. Loie was so interested in science. Um, and Marie was obviously so interested in science and she was also a teacher. You know, she taught, she homeschooled kids for a while, taught them, you know, experiments like I do on my website, like adding salt to water to make an egg float. Um, and she taught college students. She taught women at a, at a school for teachers um, near Paris. So I think it was a sort of a, it's probably more of, almost like a teacher student relationship, but I think that they both loved science and that really was what drew them together because they had very little else in common. And I think Lowy really respected, um, I write, I allude to this in the book, but Lowy really respected Marie's desire for privacy because she loved celebrities. She was a big name dropper, as I'm sure you know. Lowy was just a character, like larger than life. And, um, but she, even in her autobiography and in her journals, she's very careful about how she talks about Marie. Sometimes she doesn't mention her name. She says, you know, the serious scientist, um, but she treasures the friendship so much that she treats it very carefully. Yeah. I'm actually, I would love for you to talk a little bit more about the fact that they're both women that really fought against sort of the um, conventional environment they were in and also against the male environment they were in. I, th I thought that was highly fascinating in your sort of highlights between the two of them. Yeah, they were both, neither of them were French, but they were both living in Paris under Nap the Napoleonic Code in which um, women were vessels for bearing children and building armies, really. <laughs> they were for, for pleasure and, and population, really. and. Um, that's a hard world for women to exist in. And Marie at times was people loved her and they, they saw her as kind of a freak. You know, they loved her and celebrated her when she was doing something that made France look good. And then they turned on her time after time, calling her a bad mother, an evil immigrant. You know, they were, she, she was really um, held down by that. They, a lot of, even though she did a lot of the work, she was the, she was the person who first, like people were into x-rays at the time and radioactivity had been discovered by Becquerel, but, but he kind of brushed it off. No one really got interested in it. She really tackled it. She was the first person to measure radioactivity. She coined the term radioactivity. She was the one who discovered uh, radium and polonium in this mining waste and came up with the chemical methods to extract it. So she did all this work and yet there were still always so many men who said she couldn't have done any of it without Pierre, called her the lab assistant, didn't wanna give her her Nobel prizes for whether it was because of 
personal drama or just simply because she was a woman. Um, and Loie faced, Loie was in a different world. I mean, she wasn't a scientist, but she also, I loved reading about her at the, you know, building her um, theater at the World Exposition in 1900. She, she took men on, she got them to do what she wanted to do. And when she couldn't, she would like give up. Sometimes she would just like hire a man to talk to some dude that she couldn't deal with, but she got things done. She didn't let her gender stand in her way. She figured, she worked her way around problems, but she certainly faced um, a lot of criticism from the press. Um, yeah, she, but she was, I think, I don't know. She had a very thick skin. But she, I think that Marie was depressed a lot and suffered a lot. And Loey just powered through. That's exactly right. I mean, that's how we have come to know Loey there, you know, sort of more specifically is that she had a very thick skin. She, and she says at one time, like, what's the secret of my success? I just did things. And I just did them with all my might. And you can you can see that, I mean, we were sort of struck that she's not the most eloquent writer. And, you know, we make our films with primary source material and our previous film on Gertrude Bell, Gertrude Bell was this unbelievably eloquent poetic writer. So we, we knew that we couldn't rely on Lowy, which didn't matter because there's a million other fantastic sources. And, and Loewy says some incredibly prescient and forward and progressive things. Um, and she says them in her own way. And she's a, you know, very grounded person with perseverance. Yeah, she kind of cobbles her words together the way she cobbled technology together. She she draws from things other people are saying and puts it together. And sometimes it's correct, sometimes it's wildly incorrect. But um, she was she was just a character. What do you think inspired her to give her radium lectures? Just because of her incredible respect and enthusiasm for Marie Curie. Yes, and I think, I think she always she when she was young, you know, she wasn't well educated. She didn't like school, but she loved learning. And I think she was just absolutely fascinated by radium yeah. and fascinated by science. And she wanted to tell the world about what she learned. I think she just couldn't keep it inside. And it was really interesting. It was also at the time it was it was sort of a popular thing to do to you know have. Um, people over to your, you know, society people would have people over to their house and look through, they project microscopic images. Um, they would have these sort of science parlor parties. Um, That's cool. But Loie, she probably, could, she was always trying to make money. So I don't know, maybe she got paid a little bit to do it. But um, I just think she loved it. But if you read her notebooks, page after page after page about science and then scribble pages and pages out and sort of trying to piece together the history of science. She was trying to make her own grand theories about science and yes. I kind of love that about her. Yes, yes. Uh, well, one thing I find also interesting that both women ultimately, you know, the, the exposure to radium, I think had real consequences for them. And the way you talk about it in the book, how it so slowly sort of dawned on them what was happening is interesting because uh we are you know uh, uh, with Loewy you know there is also no clear indication but it's it's highly highly possible that it was the exposure to radium that ultimately she had breast cancer but it was also interesting we came across some audio interviews of her dancers um th oh, that interesting yeah, they were done in the 70s. And all of them talk about how all the, the dancers, the girls that were part of their crew, uh, several of them ended up having cancer. So I thought that was very interesting to see it, how the person, Marie Curie, at the source of it, how she dealt with this 
Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So radium for Marie was her, it was her whole world. It was her, it was their grand hope. They really hoped that it would be this cure for everything that ailed humanity. I mean, the health problems. And it's a, it's incredible that it, it was the first form of radiation therapy. So in a way, she still is saving lives today. Her discovery is yeah. still saving lives today. But, you know, sometimes when you love something so much, it's hard to see the, the dark side of it, the bad side of it. Um, and I think for a long time, she just refused to acknowledge the, the damage that it was doing. Um, but at, at some point, it, she was a scientist. At some point, the evidence just said, look, all these, you know, the, the, the dial painters, the radium girls are dying. Mm. People around her were dying. Um, and she couldn't explain it away anymore. And she did start implementing, um, I write about this in the book, she did start implementing implementing safety measures in her lab and drawing people's blood. But um, it wasn't until that speech she gave um, in the United States, I think, that she really spoke out saying, we have to regulate this industry. It's it's dangerous. Yeah, crazy. It's really um, What did I want to ask you guys? Um, Oh, have you seen any of her dancing costumes? Because I know there are a bunch of them at the De Young Museum, but I wasn't able to see any. I'm so hoping you can get some for your film to show us. Well, we will we'll see. I mean, all those museums are still closed, but we have your camera photos. We have your uh, some of your images that we can ask them specifically about some of the, the stuff. We'll see. We hope we hope we can. We we were able to see an incredibly beautiful quilt at the Mary Hill Museum. Did you make it out to the Mary Hill Museum? No, I wanted to go so badly. I I'm going to go when the pandemic's over. It was on my list and I didn't make yes. it. Yes. And they're open a very short, they have a very short season. And so we just, you know, got in, we just squeaked in. In their time frame, and they—it's really quite a magnif magnificent, very large, the size of a quilt, all painted, very brightly colored. So that's a great indication of of what uh, her fabrics looked like. Yeah, yeah. For, maybe, go ahead. Maybe if I just was going to say for the audience, the Mary Hill Museum is the museum that was founded by Lowy and Alma Spreckles and Sam Hill. And it's it's like very far up <laughs> near, near or in, somewhere in Oregon, Washington border. Uh, but it's it really sits on this magnificent cliff, kind of like a cliff overlooking the river. And, and, and the museum holds a large collection that um, of Lowy, uh, photographs and you know written material and also queen marie for her, from her friendship with queen marie um a lot of material was um donated to the museum so i mean one thing a lot of people don't realize is that Lowy really was one of the first people to bring french art to america and she brought a lot of um rodin's sculpture to america and also helped found the um palace of the legion of honor in san francisco with alma spreckles and I love that I grew up in the summers in the Bay Area and we used to go to that museum and um, we used yeah. to go to the Exploratorium, which was housed in that old, it was housed near that old dome where I sent you guys that video of Loie dancing at the Panama Pacific or yes. her girls dancing. Yes. Yes. But it was so, it's so astonishing to, to kind of know a place and then learn what happened there in the past. And it, I, I just thought that was so interesting that she, um, brought that art to San Francisco in the middle of World War I. She was going back and forth well, she, on ships. Yeah, I mean, and she even, some of the other artwork that she brought over, she brought Eileen Gray's uh, designs and furniture. I mean, she was really quite a mover and a shaker in getting things done. I mean, that was truly uh, pretty incredible. That was an incredible an addition, of course, to the Rodin sculptures and uh, doing the, the exhibition for him at the 
the arts club in New York and and going back to the textiles, the fact that she um, they did a whole exhibition, an exhibit of her textiles at the Louvre at one point. And oh, um, yeah. I read somewhere that, you know, some very wealthy person in Europe, I forget if it was like the Rothschilds or someone like had bought all of those, right? Or had, the, had them somewhere, who knows where they are now. Well, we have, it's interesting, that's really interesting because we have at Mary Hill, they have the, the sort, sort of the program for the exhibition and they actually tell you all of the people that have lent the costumes or fabrics for the exhibition and it is the Rothschilds. Oh, is, is it? one of them and Rudolf Valentino and many other important, famous and fabulous people of that era. And actually we um, had a connection to the Rothschilds in London and so got a message to the archive in France to see if they had Loewy Fuller's fabrics, but uh, we didn't get an, we didn't have any success. Oh, shoot. Wouldn't that be incredible? Yes. <laughs> well, and even the de Young has the, the collection from the Bancroft from the Joseph um, Paget Fredericks collection. And it was so interesting when I contacted them because they said, no, you can't see them. But I sent them a little newspaper article mentioning that um, lots of them had been painted with fluorescent chemicals. And I said, it, they might be radioactive. And then they were like, oh, then you maybe we'll pull attention. those out. And they, they actually analyzed a couple. I think I freaked them out, but, um, but it's fascinating. I mean, it would be really interesting for a textile scientist to go in and look at what chemicals she used to dye those um, and just do an analysis of yeah. all those old textiles. Totally. fascinating girls that, that talk in their interview about how they were like sleeping on those on those freshly dyed fabrics and how you know that this was um some you know they were in constant contact with it they they helped dye everything i mean there was it appears that there was a real almost like a little studio a dyeing studio you know studio with where they all the girls were dyeing stuff and and Chloe was, and I think there was also some material, you know, fabric that was shown and sold uh, at the gallery of, um, of oh, Eileen Gray. Gray, exactly. Oh, really? I didn't know yes. that. Yes. There was an exhibition there as well, uh, just for the fabrics alone. So that was interesting. Oh my gosh, I cannot wait to see your film. I'm so excited. <laughs> Well, this is actually, uh, I'm curious because as a, you know, writer of a book, you have, you know, you obviously can't make a 10 volume edition. Uh, so how did you decide sort of what to keep in and what, you know, what not? I, I mean, both stories are extensive. Yeah. So that's a good question. For example, with the Lowy Fuller, there's a whole hundreds and hundreds of letters about Queen Marie. Of Romania and I chose not to focus on that story it was too much I wanted to focus more on um, I really tried to focus on Marie and Loi and I'm I'm a very visual person and I I wanted to focus on perhaps like scenes from their life that hadn't been as well explored and that I found like that imagine in my mind that would be visually exciting like Loi dancing on top of the Eiffel Tower oh. or like Marie and her girls in the Grand Canyon or um Oh, I don't know. There's so many. Just Loey, just Loey on stage. Her, her Salome, her performance of Salome. I read the, all the descriptions of it, and I just wanted to watch that dance. Um, so I really just focused on the years when they, you know, the the important formative years, sort of, and then the years when they knew each other. And I hate books where like everyone dies at the end. So I decided to just keep, like, Mar like let Marie let Marie move on. Like she was always doing like Marie's like, I got to get back to the lab, you know, lowe has gone, but um, I, I really chose to focus on that. And then it was so hard. I'm glad you're making a film. It was so hard to choose images for the book. And I really did the same thing. I tried to focus on images of important images of Marie and Loey and the important people in their lives and not show other cool things like, you know, the shed where they worked or the follies or, um, but people, 
the internet's so great. People can go online and, and see a lot of these things and explore maps of the world exposition or whatever. Yeah, I always think that if, if it's inspiring to go and dig deeper, uh, you know, dig deeper, that's really what you kind of want, right? How are you choosing what to focus on? <laughs> Well, well, one thing I just wanted to mention, we have a sort of a new, a new mystery because we like to research and explore different mysteries. Um, we came across a reference in a letter from the 70s that there was newsreel footage of Loey Fuller's funeral. So that is the new, the brand new mystery that is that we're going to really try to track down. I mean, the other mystery, of course, is that we've so far only discovered the first half of her film, Lalise de la Vie. The second half has to be somewhere, but so we don't, we will, we're going to try to find it. But this is our, our next uh, exploration. That's so cool. I love the mysteries. And I love that you guys have dug up more about um, Loie's partner, Gab, because I wasn't able to find out much about her other than what Loie had written about her. Well, that's the thing that was very annoying was that it felt when we um, have, we're in touch with all the biographers. And when we've spoken to the biographers, no one really had primary source material on anything about Gab except for the writings of Lowy or yeah. the writings of Isadora Duncan. Um, and it, it it just felt sort of wrong. It felt as though the biographers were sort of taking, it, each biographer was just copying what everyone else had already said. So we did find uh, like all the dates and details about Gab and her family. The other complicating thing is that Wikipedia is completely wrong. It has the yeah. wrong birth dates, wrong death dates, wrong yep. parents, wrong, you know. And it so, is, yeah, yeah, that's crazy. The only uh, thing I was able to dig up on Gab that I thought was cool was some of her, um, from the New York Public Library of Performing Arts, some of her old um, journal entries from when she was growing up. And it said, it was, it was like, you could imagine people filling out, you know, what's your favorite flower? What's your favorite song? But it was, it was cool. It gave you a, what's your favorite, who's your favorite musician? It was, um, it was just cool. It was a little bit of an insight into her personality. Yeah. I'm curious, but, did you ever see, talk about the New York Public Library, did you see the book that had all the signatures that are like Rorschach? Yes, it's so cool. Because we've only seen a few of them. I mean, we we you know we we got to a certain point, and we have, you know have been dying to go back, but obviously since March it's basically closed. But um, but how did, how does that book look like? Just can you describe? Like, it's were there beautiful? It's just a small. It's an autograph book, as I recall. It's sort of long. I think I sent you guys pictures from it. Yeah, you may. But have, what yeah. Loie did was she got she got her friends, I think, like Camille Flammarion and Auguste Rodin, to um, autograph it, and then when the ink was still wet, she would close it and open it back up, and it's it's really kind of stunning. So um. That was cool. I, the first time I was at the library, I didn't see it. And then when I went back, that was one of the things I asked for because I really wanted to see it. Yeah. But, um, visual, that's something that is very visual, obviously. And we want to do something with it because it's also sort of the color that spreads out. It's like when you put the color in the water, you know, and and how, you know, how it dissipates. I think that there Ray was- Loey Fuller. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yes. Another book I would love to see, I think there's one at the Minneapolis Institute of Art is, uh, I think it's Roche, his, um, oh, Pierre Roche. Pierre Roche's book uh, that he did, it's sort of three-dimensional um, paperwork of Lowy. It's supposed, I would really love to see that. I've never seen one anywhere. I, I did actually have a chance to see it last March, right before the, the lockdown um, at a rare book. 
uh, <gasps> dealer. Oh, cool. And well, it was twenty five thousand dollars, <laughs> so it's a little a little out of uh, price range, but um, it was quite beautiful. It was the images were bas relief, yes, and sculpted for our. But it's interesting for our purposes. Not that interesting because. Uh, it wouldn't come across in film very well. So we didn't have to even think about spending $25,000. Not, yeah. not that we would have. Not that we would have. That's one thing that's so cool about Loie is all the famous artists who made sculptures of her and paintings. Toulouse Lautrec. And uh, she posed for Rodin. There's documentation of that. But he never completed yeah. um, a, a sculpture of her. But I think a lot of like people would recognize if you said, oh, hey, remember that one Antiques Roadshow when someone brought on this lamp and it was worth like $20,000? And that was a Loie Fuller was it? bronze oh, lamp. Yeah. That's really interesting. Do you, you know, we've seen references to her casts of hands. Did you, oh. did you come across more material about that? Don't they, aren't those at Mary Hill? I think, I think they're at Mary Hill. Some are at Mary Hill. Okay. But I've it seems seen as though she did tons of them, which are, so I don't know what happened to them. And she did a dance of the hands and yeah, she was into hands. Yeah, I think she has like maybe Rodin's maybe and Ev Curie's. I don't know. She has a lot of, I think she liked famous people's hands, right? Yes. Yes. Um. I'm trying to think what else I wanted to, well, that's, Sabine, that's so cool that you worked on that Picasso goes to the movies. I was researching um, Picasso for this book because I knew they had interacted um, in part because he um, did those paintings of Sada Yako. And um, I, I was an art major in college and was very interested in Picasso. So I loved, loved, loved that, that, film so that's so cool that you worked on that yeah i mean it's an interesting it's a really interesting theory i mean it's sort of like a, a, it was new at the time i think no one had looked at it under that you know banner of the movies and 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 just i mean one of the things i also find so interesting about both women and the time period it was such a a time of change and new technology and new invention i mean imagine living in that in that time period where so much is happening and such the world is changing so drastically and and i think that just to see the two of them in that context is also fascinating i am so fascinated with that time period and just the fact that they were you know dissecting the atom and Picasso was dissecting traditional figure. Um, what I love about that time period were just all the people from around the world who came to Paris and there were just, society wasn't as compartmentalized and people didn't have the same, didn't feel the same limitations. People, you know, Flammarion would be a famous um, scientist, but he also was into, you know, spirit, into seances yes. and people, People would, you know, get teased sometimes for things they believed that couldn't be proven. But I, I think it was very, I think people were more creative because they didn't feel as limited just because people didn't know as much. So it was sort of like, try anything. Um, One yeah. of the things I think is so amazing about Lowy Fuller is when you think about how she was born during the Civil War. I mean, yeah. like, and then she becomes the face of Art Nouveau and incredibly famous in, in Paris. It, it is amazing. You have, to, you have to have your stars all aligned. Yeah, exactly. But I think a lot of people did. And I think a lot of it, I think a lot of what happened in that time period for everyone, and we've talked to, is is just that it wasn't just them. It was the people who they were talking to. It was the the friends that they had. Um, if you look at Picasso and his circle, they were all and or the scientists Marie and her circle. They were talking to each other constantly. Um, 
and even in science, it was more interdisciplinary, you know, the chemists and the physicists and the, and Pierre was also into biology and that's, you know, radiation therapy. But um, I think that's just like creative gold when you get so many people in one place talking about exciting things um, from different disciplines. And I think that's one thing that we're kind of sadly missing a little bit now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Well, I think that is also just to come back to what you said initially, what sort of connected to, to the curiosity. Because one thing I'm also thinking is, you know, the fact that Marie opened up to Loie, I mean, she could have easily just like said, oh, please, you know, she's like an amateur who is like trying, you know, the fact that she she opened her arms and it, to this exchange and the exchange didn't just, wasn't just for, you know, a few times, it really yeah. lasted to where even her daughters, Marie's daughters, or Ev had a, had a relationship with Loi, and when Loi died, wrote to Gab. I mean, it just, it feels, you know, it, it's hard to sometimes figure out what, you know, when we're thinking of them as these celebrities, you know, knowing their stories and to see though that, you know, there was a, it was a really deep relationship or, you know, at least the relationship that was solid that lasted for many years. Yeah, and I think it clearly was a solid relationship. You can see that. And I think that's what is so special and important. Um, these And these women supporting each other, you know, Loey writing a letter to Marie when, when Marie is under all this public pressure, her, she's been, had an affair that's come to light. Um, men are trying to kick her out of science, basically. And Loi writes her a letter saying, I love you, stay strong. I mean, that's that's what women do for each other, right? They have each it, other's backs. And very they authentic. certainly do in this book. The, their yeah. relationship seemed very authentic. Different in feeling a little bit than uh, Queen Marie of Romania and Loi. Just, just slight different. Absolutely felt. different. That was... Yeah. That, yeah, that one was a little more, um, it just, uh, not on as, not on stable ground. Exactly. <laughs> Royal and royalty and subject more. So yeah. Anyway. So and do you want to, sh should we open up to questions? Yeah, that'd be great. I don't know if anyone has any questions. Uh, here we go. I'm back. Uh, yes, people do have questions. So thank you, everyone, who has been commenting where you're watching from and uh, asking questions already. Uh, so I'm going to work, try and go back to the first question we got, which is a few minutes ago. Um, this one is from Brenda. Did uh, they, Loie and Marie, have mutual friends? Um, you know, there sounds like they're kind of in the same circle somewhat. So Brenda would like to know. Did they have any other <laughs> mutual friends? I don't think they did, really. Do you guys know of any? Well, well, Loie introduced them um, to Rodin, and I don't know how that, how strong that friendship. I think Loie's friendship was probably a little stronger, and I think Flammarion must have been also one of the the people that they both frequented. But other than right. that. Uh, and I guess sure they both they both knew Edison too. Um, yes, yes, that's true. But Pierre Pierre Curie and Flammarion were both interested in spirituality and were studying seances at um, at the university. I think they would bring in um, they would bring in a, a medium and have her run a seance and try to. They would actually be testing with their equipment to look for you know electrical changes in the room or whatever. So, but. Yeah, I don't, so they probably knew each other, but um, I don't know that they were tightly connected to the same people right. at all. Not that they would necessarily socialize in a group with other people. That didn't doesn't seem necessary. All right, so yeah, we have um, another question here about the film. So we've already dropped a link to those of you who are interested in uh, Ziva and Sabina's film. It's obsessedwithlightdocumentary.com. Um, but I'll have you both answer just a little more uh, in depth. Will it be available to stream somewhere? T tell us about when this film will be around. <laughs> that's, the, that's the golden question. Um, 
we are we're editing we're in the editing phase right now so we expect the film would be done in about a year so in a check back with us actually what you can do is you can actually go to the website and sign up because we send about every three or four months we do send updates newsletter updates <laughs> Awesome. All right. So here is another question from uh, from Jody. Liz, what was one of the most surprising things you discovered while researching? Uh, you know, honestly, I was very surprised. And this this wasn't like a something that I found in a postcard or anything. I was surprised that Marie Curie lived to be 66 with the sheer volume of radioactivity she was exposed to for so many years and she did have a lot of health problems later in life but she um <laughs> i have oh yeah i have a little piece of radium here i have this little spintharoscope like the one that Loie fuller i don't know if you can see that took to um america with her it has a tiny piece of radium in it and if i hold my geiger counter up to this it's very radioactive that is just a speck dust sized speck of radium salt and Marie Curie was um, constantly exposed to massive amounts of chemicals as she was purifying radium, massive amounts of radioactivity. They would that would be in the lab. So I found the most surprising was how long Marie Curie lived. Um, they were x-raying during World War I. Uh, Marie and her daughter Irene were x-raying um, Patients constantly um, not always wearing lead aprons, exposed to huge, huge numbers of x-rays. So um, that, yeah, I found that very surprising and wonderful that she lived that long. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, here's one from Nancy. Who do you identify more with as you are both a scientist and an artist? Also, how did you know there would be sufficient information regarding their relationship to develop this story? Okay, first, so first question, definitely I'm more of a lowy. I'm, I have my, my ideas. They run fast and things like I can actually do them. I have ideas that are too big for me <laughs> and I'm not very organized. Um, but um, I, I, and I'm, I love art and music and, but um, I love Marie too. Um, as for how I knew there was a story here, I did my research. So I, I came up, I, I ran across Loie's name in Marie's um, daughter Ev's biography of her mother. I was fascinated. I started digging. Um, I read lots of biographies. Um, some of them have stuff that's not true. I went to the New York Public Library and tried to find primary sources for things. Um, and within within a couple of months, I think I knew that. I had a book and I was super excited about it because I was love the idea of the friendship of these two women. So, but yeah, definitely more of a Lowy. I wish I were more of a Marie, but <laughs> how about you guys, Ziva and Sabine? Are you more of a Lowy or more of a Marie? <laughs> well, I'm definitely, mm, I have some qualities which I can connect with Loey, like try, like I strive to be very open and creative and curious, but would not call myself a Loey. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Sabina, what about you? Well, I mean, if we're talking about character, uh, yes, <laughs> I'm not sure. I think it's probably a mixture of the two in a way. Um, but uh, at, at, in terms of art versus science, I'm definitely the, more of an artist than a scientist. Although I do, I mean, when we do our research, I feel we're like scientists. I mean, we, it's like we uncover so much material and we're like, don't let up until we, you know, turn every stone and we'll do that with Lois with this project as well. I mean, we're we're not giving up to try to find the second reel and all that thing. So in that way, well, we are as persistent as I think both of these women were. Yeah. 
that was a great question. Thank you, Nancy. Um, this one uh, is good because I'm sure we're all feeling a little cabin fever. So Liz, talk about your travels you did to research this book. Tell oh us about gosh. traveling. <laughs> we went to Paris for a week. Uh, my husband, Ken, and um, I went to Paris for a week. And it was it was so wonderful. I wanted to, I, have, I had been to Paris before, but I wanted to walk down the streets and see where Loewy lived and see where Marie worked go to the Folie Berger, um, we went to a show there. And it, yeah, it was it was wonderful. We were there in September. It, it really helped me find details for the book. You know, there were chestnuts all over the street. Um, I, I tried to notice little things that I hadn't noticed when I was there before, but um, just uh, being in the Paris Opera um, and going to the, there was a library, this hidden library, it took me like two hours to find it, but, it was down and that you had to kind of go down in the basement and then go up some stairs. I felt like I was in the Phantom of the Opera. It was cool. <laughs> and, but then you got in there and it had this beautiful dome ceiling and these gorgeous paintings um, and a little card catalog where you pull, pull things out. So I did, I did a little research. I wasn't able to access any of Marie's stuff when I was there. I got a library card at the, at the French library, but um, the Paris Opera Library was super cool. But yeah, Paris was amazing. I can't wait to go back someday. Mm -hmm. We stayed in Montmartre. It was incredible. <laughs> yeah. Uh, here's one from Jim. Liz, there are other are there other comparable area eras in art and science when all this experimentation happened at once and refracted off one another? I love the idea of collective energy impacting and inspiring each other. I'm sure there are, but I am not a historian, so. <laughs> Uh, Sabina or Ziva, do you know? Um, I would say that, you know, the 20s in Paris, but, oh, yeah. what would you say? I, I mean, I, I would not um, purport to be an expert on that either, really. I mean, it seems as though things changed in the 50s, like the 50, but not, you know, yeah. not my... Oh yeah, I read a book called Ninth Street Women about um, the modern art movement in America. That was pretty. That was a pretty amazing scene. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the thirties, forties, fifties, sixties in New York City. Yeah. I mean, the thing that was so remarkable about the early nineteen hundreds is that the the nineteen hundred Paris Exposition, in particular, was the absolute merging of the most fabulous artistic accomplishments like Tiffany's punch bowl and the but you know the dragonfly chandeliers with these incredible scientific accomplishments like the huge telescope and the and so it was it was a little bit um I think it, because as you said Liz it was very early in people's understanding of science and scientific theories, it just felt seems as though it would have felt like an explosion of creative energy in both art and science. Yes, yeah, definitely something special about this time. Uh, Patty says that Liz, you're being modest. You are both a scientist and an artist. So, <laughs> oh, Patty also says, good point. The Renaissance. <laughs> So if we're going- Oh, thank you, Patty. Backwards, backwards, yeah. That is a great point. Um, <laughs> and okay, I thought I saw another question in here. Do, do, do. Oh yeah, another one from Jody. Uh, what do you think they, uh, Marie and Loie, learned from each other? I Well, Loie learned a lot about science. I mean, I think she knew very little about science. She writes in her notebook after visiting Edison, she writes in her notebook, like, I didn't even realize what I was doing in my, you know, my, um, she called it her studio. My studio was science, but I have been exploring science. Um, she had been, you know, looking at textiles. She had this cool geology microscope. Um, so, but I think Marie from Lowy probably just got some exposure to a different world. She, she saw. She went to see Lowy dance when Lowy was maybe in nineteen 
I forget in my book, maybe 1925, 19, maybe 24. There's a, it's a documented, like, there's a newspaper article saying that Marie Curie sat in the balcony at Louis's troops performance. But I think, um, I know that Marie and Pierre liked to go to plays. Um, Eve writes about, Eve writes about that in her um, biography of her mother. So I think, I think that Marie did appreciate culture and she probably liked hearing, I don't know, I'm guessing they told each other stories. <laughs> you know, this is what's happening in entertainment right now. <laughs> Awesome. Well, uh, do any of you have final questions for one another or comments for one another? No, Sabina and Ziva, thank you so much. I'm so grateful to know you and um, to have, I'm going to keep, I know I'm done with my book, but I'm just going to keep bugging you and I'm just going to, I miss Loie and Marie. I'm going to just keep bugging you so I can reconnect with Loie every once well, in a while. Well, congratulations on your book. It's absolutely so, it's really so beautiful and so, so engaging. I think that you're doing a lot of the the work for us. The, the pre, pre-publicity pre for Loie, you're doing <laughs> it for us because your book is, is great. It has legs. Yeah, and I was going to say also, I really think their story is so inspiring also for younger generations, you know. I mean, that's what I think is amazing about them. Uh, and and so I think you, the book is definitely something that I would recommend to, you know, anybody to also to read with their daughters and give them really a sense of, you know, these women's lives. Yeah. Well, I hope together we can all help make Loewy famous again, right? <laughs> yes, that's a great right. goal. We have one more question sneaking under the wire. Thank you, Connie. Um, can you comment on obstacles these women faced as females in science and art? How is it different or similar to what women might experience today in those fields? I think this is a good one for all of you. <laughs> we talked about this a little. Uh, you know, if you have kids, it's very hard to get anything done, and women. As we know, even today, um, and but much more back then, we're completely responsible for childcare and taking care of the house. And Marie had her father-in-law to help her um, take care of her girls so she could go to the lab. And Loie had Gab to take care of all of her books and you know finances. So the struggle, I think, is real um, for women back then as it still is now I think to to find time to be creative when you're just trying to keep everyone's head above water what do you guys think well I mean one of the things that's very um that's sort of contemporary and relevant from Loewy is that she applied to copyright her dance and of course she failed the, it, her, the injunction was declined and tons of imitators sprang up and it's something that actually Taylor Swift talks about because of her copyright issues. So that, her, that ruling stayed in force until 1976, the ruling from Loie Fuller, until finally choreography was eligible to be copyrighted. Isn't that incredible? I didn't know that. That's yeah. amazing. It's, it's amazing. 76? Wow. Yes, 1976. Wow. That's why she took out patents for everything else, because that was the only thing she could. Right, for her robe and her. And her chemicals. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting, one of the people we interviewed for our, for the film is Robert Wilson, the theater director who, uh, you know, quote, quotes Loie a lot in terms of her, the way she stage lighting and all that. And he said, even, even at, you know, he, at, when something is too abstract, it's still, even for him, he was trying to, um, to register, you know, register a work, which was Einstein on the beach, you know, it's also obviously a few years back, but still it's very hard when it's something is abstract. I mean, it has to be like, in that was the reason with with the choreography. It had to be a story. It had to be something concrete. 
Interesting. And Loewe's choreography was so unlike anything that had ever been seen before. And uh, that's what made it so special. Was yes. That it was abstracted. And that's why people fell in love with it. And that's why she wasn't able to copyright it. Oh, that's so Crazy. interesting. Yeah. Well, to be continued. Yes. <laughs> wow. That was a very good question. And that was a great little tidbit. Um, so yeah, thank you all for being here with us for this book launch, this virtual book launch. Um, you know, we wish we could have had it at Majors and Quinn because Liz is, you know, a wonderful local author. Um, but this way we were able to have Sabina and Ziva as the conversation partners. And that was just so great learning about the film, the upcoming film as well. Uh, I did just put a link to the book itself on the Majors and Quinn website in the comments there. So please go to majorsandquinn.com and check out the book. Um, and we just really appreciate, you know, your support of an independent bookstore and, and Liz's local bookstore. So thank you so much. Um, if you are in the area, we are open to limited browsing, 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. every day. Of course, masks are required and a limited number of people are in the store at a time, but you can swing by and say hello. We love to see you. Um, or you can just purchase online. We ship, we do uh, curbside pickup and all of that. So if you have any questions, you can always also give us a call as well. So thank you once again, all three of you, Liz, Ziva, and Sabina, and have a wonderful rest of your evening and congratulations. congratulations thank you. Liz. Good night. And thank you. Thank you. Bye. Good night.